You know you're live, right? <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you? How are you? We are going to give folk a few moments that we're going to ask you to share the uh, broadcast and invite others to come in. And then tonight, we're going to have a different type of prophetic class tonight. Amen. I'm excited. How about you guys? Amen. 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 I believe God has something to say to us, and we need to talk about it. Amen. Amen. So let's take a few moments as others are coming in, and uh, let's share. This is called digital evangelism. Let's invite folk in. We want them to know that the heart of God is what God is saying. And tonight we're going to be talking from a biblical perspective. At least they are. I'm going to be asking questions. And all. Uh, but we are getting our hearts and minds together. Because I believe God is going to give us some wisdom tonight. Amen, class? Amen. For those that are coming on, this is our Apostolic and Prophetic Training uh, Institute where we teach. And tonight, we are going to talk about church and politics. So as you share, just type that in tonight. That's the topic. Just add, invite them to join us. Yeah. Let's share, let's share. And when you're coming in, just let me know who you are so I can acknowledge some people. Amen. I see you, Deborah Monroe and Sister Roslyn. And I'm gonna meet others may I may not be friends with, but we welcome you online. Elder Robinson. All right, Minister Evangelist Brown, come on in. We want to invite others. There's some others on. I, I just can't see who they are, so I can acknowledge them. But we got other pastors here that they may can see them. But we are glad that you are here. Amen. We're glad that you're here. All right, are we about ready on tonight? Like I said, tonight. And as others are coming in, we'll continue to talk about it. We're talking about conversations of church and politics. And so even here in the audience, if you have additional questions, um, we want to be able to answer those. But we just want to hear wisdom tonight because we have an election coming up on Tuesday. And we just want to have the heart of God. This, and, and let me just say this, tonight is not about endorsing a particular candidate, but we just want to give you some information. Uh, Hosea 4, 6 says that we are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we are, especially as a people, we're not informed about the issues we haven't done our homework, and so we make emotional decisions. And so tonight, we, we're hoping to, uh, to inform you and to educate you and to give you some things to think about. Again, this is not to endorse a particular candidate, a particular party, but this is from, I believe, from the heart of God. We just gonna ask, I'm going to ask them some questions and let them share their heart based on what I believe God has given them and then throw a couple of curveballs in there for them. Amen. Since this is the training institute. <laughs> Amen. But before you know how we do it, before we do anything, 
God must get glory. Yes, sir. God must get honor. He must get praise. So can we just open our mouths for a few months and uh, moments and begin to tell God how good he is and how we appreciate him. And so, Father God, we thank you. There is none like you. There is none that can be compared to you. You are God, and besides thee, there is none other. And so, God, we enter into your gates with thanksgiving and into your courts with praise, God. We are thankful, and God, we bless your name. We praise your name. We give you glory. We give you honor, God. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same sun, God, your name is to be praised. It is a strong tower, and the righteous run in, and they are safe. And God, we ask you to dwell here among us tonight. Be pleased, God. We thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelational knowledge, God. We thank you that, God, your mind and your heart will be in the midst of this discussion tonight, God. Open us up and access us, God. Deal with our prejudices. Deal with our wrong ways of thinking, our wrong mindset, God. Because this is about you and your will and your purposes, God. So, God, we open ourselves up and we say, have your way. Have your way, God. Have your way, Father. Have your way. Have your way in this nation, Father. And God, we thank you, God. We know you're not a divisive God. God, we know you're a God of love, God. And so, God, we arrest every spirit that's not like you, God. And we tell the kingdom to arise, God. And your kingdom come. And your will be done in the earth, God. Now, God, we will be that light that you are calling us to be. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you and we give you glory and we give you honor. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 Hello, pastors. Judy, Gerald, we thank you for being a part of this. Apostle Denise, Denise. Lawson, thank you for being a part. And others that are coming in, we just want to acknowledge you and stuff. And again, tonight, we are talking about the church and politics. That's what our class is on tonight. And so what I would like to do before we get started with the questions, I want the uh, panelists to just introduce themselves you can take a minute and tell us who they are, their background, before we can we get started. So I'm gonna start with I guess, Pastor Joe. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Good evening everyone. What a opportunity it is, Joseph Davis, uh, senior pastor of the Church Center, overseer of Truth Catholic Total Church in Marcelo. Um, I'm saved, sanctified in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> no one. All right. And so uh, I'm glad to be able to share from what I think from a kingdom perspective and also share a little bit of uh, what I know about the political process and some of the things that's going on and maybe some of the spiritual perspectives uh, on what's happening. So I'm um, glad to be here. I'm a husband to one wife and, um, Amen. and two beautiful kids. So it's got to be good. Amen. Amen. Good evening, everyone. Eric, Eric and Eve, my name, Pastor Bible based Church, Tallahassee. I also work a full-time job in politics, so it's actually fitting to be a part of this conversation. As Pastor Joe, I'm filled with that same Holy Ghost he's filled with. <laughs> Amen for that. Also a husband of one, a father of two, a 14-year-old son and a 10-year-old daughter who are such a great blessing. And just very honored for this conversation. And I want to thank you again, Apostle, for yes. the vision and the conversation. Let's go forth and have fun. Amen. I also want to acknowledge Apostle Glenda McCorkle all the way from North Carolina. One of my granddaughters, amen, and online um, watching as well. Like I said, there's others. This is just our interaction, amen, that I want. I like to just acknowledge folks. I appreciate them taking the time out to be a part tonight because normally our, our classes are closed, and so this is good. That I, but I thought that what we would talk about tonight, the body of Christ needs to hear, and, and, and we need to have a conversation from a biblical perspective. And this is not to say that we are experts on this matter, but we want to at least have some conversation and dialogue and really look at the scriptures and see what it is that God is saying. 
So with that being said, let's get started. Amen. Um, my first question to the panel is, and, and I'm going to start, guys, so you'll know, I'm going to start with easy questions. <laughs> and, you know, to get warmed up. And then uh, we're going to get into some real meat of the matter. And again, I've asked uh, some of the class attendees if they have questions, they're going to write those as well, and we'll have time to even address those. But first question, some Christians um, believe that there should be a separation of church and state, and that we shouldn't even be involved in politics. So as leaders in the body of Christ, should we be involved? in politics? Um, yes, um, but I think that yes comes with an understanding. Um, so first yes, number one I believe that as Christians um, we are have dual citizenship, so to speak. So the one number one, we're kingdom minded, born of God, born of Christ. So that's the kingdom in itself, right? So that's the kingdom in itself. And then we're living in the earth where we have laws and structures and now we are citizens of the earth that we live in. And then, so we should first of all participate um, in bringing a kingdom culture, the values of the Bible, to that earthly realm or that earthly structure. Um, because the more that God is enforced in our laws, in the conduct of the welfare of men, we believe that we have greater success. So on that premises is a yes, but they are there are some things to know that you know uh, IRS does prohibit um, activity like. Uh, lobbying, a church lobbying on behalf of a political person and things of that nature. So there is some separation, right? Um, but the separation is just the way you go about doing it. So it's really about how you represent yourself. Um, but we ought to, I want to use yes instead of no, um, so we can be involved. But how we're involved, how we advocate, and how we become advocacy of of this political process is important. And I also think, let me say this, I also think it's important because we want to maintain a distinction, at least as uh, first believers, on really whose side we're on. And we're really on God's side more than anybody else. All right. So I would say right there, we, we can drop that. Okay. You know, I'll just jump in on the, on, the, on the bandwagon on that one. Everything yes. Apostle David said, I agree with. The thing I would add on is what he ended off at is for, for kingdom citizens, it's important for us to remember where our residents lie. We are kingdom first. And so as much as we say there should be a separation, and if you know anything about the Constitution, it says that. However, no elected official is running for office without trying to come to your church. <laughs> and so we have to be mindful of that. And, and what I would submit to us is that we should compromise kingdom principles for the appeasement of man. We shouldn't, we shouldn't compromise the declaring of the word of God on a Sunday morning to give somebody the microphone and do a stump speech. The same point, we need to educate ourselves in that regard. Um, if you go back to the civil rights movement, or Dr. King and the others, where he gave a major speech, they gathered at the church. And they had prayer, they had fellowship, they had time of strategizing. The church has always been the beacon of hope, especially in the black community. And so separation of state may sound good, um, but it's not really realistic. The add on to that something that Apostle David said I think is so important is that when you start engaging in this regard, you need to understand um, federal guidelines um, and make sure that you don't allow intrusion into your books in that regard. And so if, if you want to go that route, ignorance to, to the laws and to the Constitution does not give you a free pass. You have to understand what you get yourself into. I tell every saint of God to understand what is going on. As much as we care about national, don't ignore local politics. Those are the things that have the greater impact on your, your weekly fellowship is local things that are taking yes. place. Yes, that's good. Now, we've got some people that they believe that my vote really doesn't matter um, because they think maybe the system is fixed or rigged or they don't like no one that's running. What do you say to these type people that just sit on the sidelines and just say, my vote doesn't matter, so I won't vote? How do we 
educate them on how do we, what do we, how do we address that population of people? So what I would say is the only vote that doesn't matter is the one that's never cast. If you don't vote, of course it doesn't matter. But you need to understand um, that every vote that cast has an impact, which is why it's important on the front end we educate ourselves on who's running, what their platforms are, et cetera, et cetera. We should not be beholden to, and I'll talk more about this on probably a later question, beholden to one over the other. You know, educate ourselves in that regard. But if you don't vote, of course it doesn't matter. Now, you have to also look at the root of where a person comes from in that thinking. Usually something has transpired, um, something took place in, in a more recent time where they felt that way, or they've been watching news media and they feel that way. Now listen, there is corruption in the system. We have seen examples in the past where, where voter suppression took place. Having said that, to, to allow yourself to think that line of thinking is dangerous because we all have a sphere of influence. And when you start having that way of thinking, others will follow your lead. And now because you're not doing it, they're not doing it. We're seeing now in this, in this election season, people for the first time who are voting, who are influential in other arenas of life. You have hip hop artists for the first time who are who are voting, but for years they've been talking about candidates and how much they support these people and never voted for those individuals. I will say to us, in my conclusion, from a black perspective, we will never see 2008 and 2012 black turnout ever again in the history of the electorate. Barack Obama was on that ballot both times. You saw historical turnout both of those years, especially in 2008. You may never see that again. Having said that, it's not an excuse for us not to still vote. Right. And I'm not talking about because of our foreparents who fought in labor, because that is something to remember, but also because thinking forward generations, those of us who are parents or you may be a grandparent, is, is what system you want your children to be involved in. And so whenever we think about it from that standpoint, the only vote that does not matter is the one that's never cast. And I think that's dangerous to have the, have the, the ability um, and the right to do it and not do it at all. That's good. I think um, I want to also espouse to what Pastor P was saying. Um, I think I think people need to get into what I call low hanging fruit, and what I call that you got to participate locally. It's easier to see the results at a local level, so you can be inspired for certain things as as the national level. All right. So when you take it, for example, when you take the 2016 election, and you know you understand how. Um, Donald, Tr Donald J. Trump became the president, you understand that he became the president not through popular vote, but through the electoral college, right? So if you don't understand, number one, and the reason I'm saying this is because the national uh, level had the electoral college as a part of it. If you don't understand that, you're confused why he lost by three million votes and still became president. And it's discouraging, you know, for some who don't know process. So knowing process is important, but I think starting locally and being locally engaged is so important. We, we put a lot of emphasis on the presidential election, rightly so, but I think we miss local elections. And I think that's a time where you can locally get your voice uh, heard. Sometimes there are elections just <laughs> on your HOA president for just small things. So sometimes we talk about participation it starts with some of these small things that we overlook. And when we start engaging, we recognize the influence we have. We recognize the perspective we have. We also, when we get involved, and that's why voting is important, you also become knowledgeable and educated. Because by virtue of participating, you start uh, getting information from other people, and people start helping you stay informed on what's happening. So voting is a part of that engagement process that gets you informed. And it helps you stay abreast of what's happening around you. Otherwise, you, you kind of become a blind citizen. You really don't understand what's going on around you. That's good. Now, let's get into this matter. <laughs> um, for the body of Christ, seemingly, um, we are divided. And a lot of it looks like we are divided by party lines. Um, you, we have the evangelicals that believe, and, and, and I'll start with this question, then we'll build upon it. And, and, and we hear the statement, we should vote principle over personality. 
What do you say to that? To that perspective? So is there a division? Absolutely. But I, I think I think something that's so important, and I wanted to make sure I said this tonight, is the danger that we have is the way our, the way our, our elections are set up, if you're not registered one or the other, you can't participate in the primary portion of an election. That which happens in August. Mm -hmm. And so many pick a side that could be a part of both the primary and the general. And I have no problem with that. My caution to anyone is when you become beholden to a party blindly. Now, why is that important? Because what I think has happened, Apostle, over the years is that is that instead of the church, instead yes. of our faith determining our outlook or our footsteps, we've allowed the world to do that for us. Yes. And so now we have we have conformed to the worldly way of doing things and that division takes place. You mentioned about the evangelicals. What's interesting, if you do research going back to slavery days, um, you, you will learn that, that the evangelicals also fought very hard to maintain slavery. And they used scripture to try to maintain that slavery to the point where that was a breaking apart. In, in especially certain like the Southern Baptists were breaking apart those denominations because when there became a conversation about is slavery right or wrong to slave have the right, a portion broke off to be able to add, to be able to hold fast to that. Now why is that important? Because when you understand the foundation of why a group is arguing a certain manner, then it makes sense in the current. What you will hear from from, from most um, evangelicals is is they don't support the current president. Or here's why they'll vote for the current president. It's because they're voting Republican, not for the current occupier, but because of the Supreme Court. So what'll happen is you'll find an agenda item that gives you the that gives you the peace. No, I don't I don't I don't support his lifestyle, they'll say. He's not an upstanding citizen. However, yes. I'd rather have him in office so for the Supreme Court say will become more conservative. And here is the danger of that. The danger of that is is that we as kingdom, we as followers of yes. Christ, have now allowed ourselves to become good. okay with that being the guide by which we make our decisions. Yes. So the division happens because in any given pulpit, somebody is misinterpreting or, or just flat out misusing text to justify behavior. Absolutely. And the danger of that is that there are people who yes. are babes in Christ who have who are beholden. Listen, again, let's go back to this standpoint. When you when I was growing up. I grew up in Los Angeles. When I was growing up, the black church, again, was the beacon of hope. And so if a person got a chance to come preach in the pulpit at your church, the members felt at peace because pastor wouldn't put them up unless pastor was okay with them. Yes. Politicians yes. come to my church talk about their election. They wouldn't be here if pastor wasn't okay with it. Right. So our peace wasn't in the, in the candidate. It was in our pastor. Right. So now fast forward to today's time, if our pastors are blindly following someone, yes is misinterpreting text for their own personal gain, all of a sudden now we feel okay with that because pastor would never do that. Yeah. And here's the danger of that. The vision comes in, so now what happens is you have a divide amongst how you interpret text. Because now people are saying that that that, that this person is God's man. I've heard so many prophecies over the years yes. of people saying the current president is God's person. Now, if you go back to some... some pre-election night yes. in 2016, you will find some evangelicals on their Twitter feed, mm -hmm. they said, Lord help our country. They went to bed assuming it's gonna be Hillary Clinton. Mm -hmm. Woke up the next morning was Donald Trump. All of a sudden now, they said it was God's will. Right. Now, if we wanna talk about God's will, you can't ignore the conduct of any person that is, that is completely opposite of the things of God. Right. And then, when it comes to election, say, but that's God's man. Gotta be mindful. Now, even David, man, the God's own heart, who God loved, God still dealt with David yes, when David was wrong. Yes. Right? And so we can't ignore the misrepresentation of the things of God. But here's the problem we have is that if you look at it, most people who argue um, um, intently and aggressively on news media on behalf of an elected official, most times it's a pastor. Yeah. Most times it's a pastor. You have seen more pastors get into the fight over masks over things that nature on national news because here is why. Because there's a belief is why would the pastor get on TV and lie? And so if I put them up there, at one more point I let it go. Think about the person who was advising the president of the pastor at home. His spiritual advisor is Paula White. Yes. Paula White church in Orlando is 93% African American. Right. 
But guess what? During these four years, she's not lost one member of her member of her ministry. Here is why: because they're beholden to her, and they, they excuse her in her endorsement. And so the division comes because the church has sat down and allowed the world to take the leadership role. That's good. I, I agree with that. I don't think there's much else to say. Because that's been one of my main uh, frustrations in what has happened. I think the church functions best when it remains as an entity of the kingdom that speaks truth to power. Yeah. I think we function best and we get most impact on both sides, whether it's democratic, independent, or well, we know how it really works. <laughs> you know, put independent in there, but we know independent don't really get as much uh, news time, coverage, the way everything is forced through media, you got one or the other for the most part is either blue or red, right? So that's where they, they, uh, the, the stream goes. But I just really believe that that's where I think the church functions better. And I think it behooves pastors to be very cautious of their influence, very guarded of when they are endorsing somebody and stop giving away endorsements so easily, so to speak. Very careful when you do do it, but when you feel like it's necessary to do, very careful. And then being able to speak truth to power, being able to hold that person accountable, and I think that's one of the tragedies that we've seen, from, well, I would say from the body of Christ, in some regards, people who are Christian, all right, still name the name of Christ, that uh, they have given away, and I, I just continue to hear the scripture, if the salt has lost its savior, it is good for nothing. Yes. And I believe that's what's at jeopardy now, because one of the things that is happening is I believe those who have religious values, right? So we like religious freedom, right? That's important, right? The ability to uh, express our faith, right? That's important. We fight for religious protection and freedom. But in that, those who are very strong on that also have to watch out for becoming naive and gullible. Because now you get somebody who don't really care about your values as much as you do, but they use you as their ticket. And they use you as their platform. And they use you and they go, they ride their, their platform, they ride their political process, and they really don't care anything about your value system. And so they're just using it to get to where they need to be. And I don't think sometimes it appears as if there's been a loss of discernment in the God of Christ. Wow. Wow. Let's, let, let's stay right there for a moment <laughs> because right now the divide is and, 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 and what's concerning for me is that a house divided against itself cannot stand. I don't know if, if you all are familiar, but I've been listening to a lot of prophetic words and Pastor McGee, you, you talked about this and all the words that I've heard sound Republican. Um, they sound one-sided. I have not heard um, a, prof a prophetic word that really gave um, other than a, a, a Republican perspective. I haven't heard a Democratic, not a good, but not a positive one. Um, and so, and let's talk about it specifically. Evangelicals, their main focus is, you know, abortion. Uh, it's about, you know, uh, gay rights, the marriage, you know, being a friend to Israel, religious freedom. Those are their primaries. And basically, and so we hear, okay, then because this is my principle, these are my, what, I, what I'm interested in, then we can ignore, like Pastor McGee was saying, we can ignore person, and they call it personality, I call it character. <laughs> we can ignore the character because this person is, you, it, it, it's, it's voting something that is biblical. How can I use a tool of Satan to do the work of God and it not be contaminated? You know, and so my question to you all is the only thing on the heart of God <laughs> abortion, um, gay rights, um, what else? Um, the focus on the family as far as our marriage, um, 
Traditional, traditional family values. Um, is that the only thing? Is and I'm not saying because I believe these things are important. But is this the only thing, though, that's on the heart of God? Oh, absolutely not. Um, uh, the Bible tells us also to take care of the widows, to take care of those who are less fortunate, um, those who are castaways. Even when Jesus even presents his, presents his ministry, and I would even say presents his prerogative of the kingdom, when we see Jesus hit the scene, he's immediately against the hierarchy system of, of not allowing the wealth, the, the, the access to the temple, um, to those who were disenfranchised, you easily see potentially that Jesus goes after the underdog. Yes. Um, that's what you see when Jesus hits the political scene. Oh, no, I don't want to see the political scene. Let me get it right. Hits his ministry. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm focusing on the angle of ministry. That, that's, that's why it's a political scene. So excuse me. But the angle of ministry that affected the political system. And that's what I meant by that. And so immediately you notice in Jesus' ministry, how kings become very nervous about him. I mean, they are very nervous. Him talking to the people, uh, doing miracles, um, speaking things very clearly, unfolding things. He's very, and he draws power. So again, um, I really feel like one of the things we we got to do is really make sure that we understand the heart of God. And we and this is the, this is the vision problem. The problem is we have allowed the parties to separate us because. Yeah. Really, we need all these issues on one, on one platform. Yes. It's what we need, yes. all right? But we, we've allowed ourselves, to, this is it, thank you, Holy Spirit. We've allowed ourselves to be manipulated. Yes, we are being played to fiddle with. I mean, there are people, and that's why I mentioned religious values, all right? I'm pro-life, right? Uh, mm. Yeah, I'm pro-life all the way. Yes. Boom, boom, all the way, yes. pro-life. Yes. Right? Not just the abortion, all right? But all the way. But we've allowed our values to be manipulated at their hands Rather say, no, give me this as well on the platform. Give me this as well. Tell me that this is important to you. Why are you not fighting for this? And I think that's what's missing out of, I'll say, yes. our kingdom-minded advocacy is that we allow them to establish their platform and, and we vote for that for saying, no, this is not, we need to align this. And I think when we only go for a few tier things, mm -hmm. it also shows that we don't care for people like God cares for. And I think that's one of the greatest tragedies. Wow. Let me jump on that, if I may. <laughs> you, you, you let me say what I was about to say, which is we have, as as a body of believers, and I'm talking to I'm talking to, to leaders right now. What we have done is we've allowed ourselves to discontinue having a heart for the things that God has a heart for, which is people. And I think that is very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous to the point now where you have to meet a certain bill even entering to the doors. And when you get to the door, you have to get another level of build. You get a seat in a certain place. Those are dangerous situations. Let me go a little bit further. You know, if, if anyone who has any level of knowledge on how elections work and how candidates work, right. the, 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 the person that you see isn't the power broker. They're just the person out front. That candidate is the one running for office. If he or she wins, they'll be the one with the title. But truth be told, there is consultants and a whole team behind them. They're actually the yeah. ones who have understood how voting works. They know who in your community is the most active voters. They know who to go after to get those votes. Let me give you a real example of something. In 2018, in the Ron DeSantis, Andrew Gillum race, if you remember that that, that race was like 30,000 plus vote difference of how Governor DeSantis won. If you go a little bit further in there though, one issue pulled a traditional black female Democratic voter who voted Democrat in every election, they broke from, from supporting um, Mayor Gillum over one issue in 2018. That one issue was school choice. Mm -hmm. Because because they believed that if Andrew Gillum had become governor, he was going to do away with the tax credit scholarship. They believe that Ron DeSantis was a proponent of it all. New York Times and Wall Street Journal wrote an article on 18% of black, black women voted for Ron DeSantis over that one issue. You go through their background, they typically voted Democratic. But in that one election, they mm -hmm. broke for him. Here's why, because they were mothers or grandmothers mm -hmm. who had grandchildren or children who were benefactors of the scholarship. And so their fear was that if, if they lose the scholarship, their child loses the choice to go to a better school. So they broke 
from their from their from their their ideology and from their registration for this regard. Now, why do I say that to you? Because it is immature to think that that was Governor DeSantis is doing. Now, while he may be a proponent of that, people behind the scenes mm -hmm. understood. Let's highlight a few issues that are very important to the block we're going after. Mm -hmm. Now, bring it to the conversation we're having right now. There is a known factor that gay marriage that 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 um, abortion, that religious freedom, that Israel, that is at the heart of a segment of people. Mm -hmm. And so, so while you may hear in a general, it's more zoned in in, even in, 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 in greater communities. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a good point. Breonna Taylor's murder in her own dwelling. Mm -hmm. The attorney general in Kentucky is a black man, yes. served a black man. It has come out after the fact that he didn't give the grand jury right. option, other options of what they could do. What people don't understand is, and I said this to people, is that the truth will later start coming out, coming out, coming out, coming out. You're watching it now. The PBA union president and the AG are unapologetic about that. But here's what they're unapologetic, because they understand that they're not trying to, to please blacks in Tallahassee. Come on. They, they know the people they're actually, the, the people they're trying to go after the ones in Kentucky who think like they think. So as much as we may not be pleased with it in Florida or in Tallahassee, they're okay in Kentucky because they are, they're, their thinking is aligned. That's important to understand because they never, they would never throw certain things in your face if that's not what, what, what the demographics showed of, of interest to you. This is important today and now. We have to understand that. The, 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 if you think about the last few days, we have seen people like 50 Cent, like Lil Wayne, like Ice Cube, and others who have found themselves now attached to President Trump and things of that nature. Now they're trying to explain themselves, and people are upset. Let me say this to people who are upset. Shame on any of us if we find our identity in what Lil Wayne tells us to do. Correct. Right. Shame on us. Yes. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen? That's become the norm because yes. we have turned our lenses from the scriptures. Right. And now we're looking at these artists to help us out. Hear me now. Here is why 50 Cent and Lil Wayne and Kanye West would support Donald Trump. It's not because it's going to help out your community. It's because of taxes. Right. Uh -huh. Because of their, they're, a different, they're a different scale than you are in from a wealth standpoint. And so they're worried about what it's going to do to them. And 50 Cent actually admitted that when he went on Instagram and said what he said. Now, why is that important? Because their reasoning for endorsing that individual is not because it's going to help our black community. Because selfishly, right. it's better for me. Right. So you look at these items that the apostle laid out and to understand now, ab abortion, you're saying on abortion usually aligns you with either you are Republican or you are Democrat. From kingdom, God cares about the people. Yes. And so the question I would ask any leader is, is can you pastor of people regardless of their leaning and, and if you can't answer that question righteously then it speaks deeper to the issues that we have at hand and i'll go back to what i said earlier is we have allowed our our registration to dictate our reformation we are now finding ourselves being controlled by how i lean versus what i read and that's the danger of it all. You look at jesus walking to the temple turn over the table because he stood for righteousness yes and I think that's important. When his disciples said, why are you talking to that, to that Samaritan woman? We don't talk to them. Je Jesus engaged her in full conversation to the point where even she questioned, why are you talking to me? Yes. Because he cares for people. Yes. And we as a people of God, we have, we have walked away from the heart of God yeah. and become way more engaged. My last point was saying earlier, i got to hit this point. For anybody from a pastoral standpoint, if I endorse someone, my endorsement should not be my church's endorsement. Come on, bro. Yeah. This is important now because what happens is, 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 is I, am, I am a voter. Right. I have the right to engage how I want to engage in an election. I have the right to endorse. Apostle David said it best. Make sure I am educated when I do an endorsement mm -hmm. and be careful when I do it. But my endorsement should not be an indictment or, or an entanglement for my church in that regard. And sometimes we allow people into our sanctuaries that we know are not benefiting our congregation, but we may be personally benefiting from th their policies and their procedures. And we have to understand that whenever we do those type of things, we have now prostituted our sanctuaries mm. for our own personal gain. Glory. 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 I think that's happening more often. I think we need to bring that awareness back that we are that 
there are there's prostitution of our sanctuary. Yes. And I think it's also disrespect. Right. Also to people right. and their their ability to vote. Now, of course, I believe biblically we should educate, train from the pastoral office, right. from the from the office of leadership, be trained on spiritual values, family values, all of these things. But I think it's also a violation of people's personal decision yeah. as well. And so I believe we lead, we govern, we we if we have discernment or we feel something, we should speak clearly. But I think there's just a level of balance that's missing. And I think but because of it, there's so much uh, prostitution, there's so much lack of discernment that's happening. So I, I echo the same system. Yeah. As a prophet, it, it, it concerns me in the body that we are hearing our own personal bids in our even in our delivery of prophecy. Specifically, let's talk about um, why is it that even though, and, and don't get me wrong, I believe abortion is wrong. I believe any marriage, when it comes, that's against what the Bible says between a man and a woman is wrong. Mm -hmm. That, you know, anything that's affecting our religious freedom, we have to stand against it. But we all say we have the Holy Spirit. Why is it, though, that I can be passionate for killing life in the womb, but I'm not interested in life outside the womb. Mm -hmm. How can I continue though and just focus on that point? Like for example, um, people will say, uh, you know, we have a, a, you know, a statement, Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And then you get Christian folk, but <laughs> they'll say, all lives matter. Mm -hmm. Won't even consider why that statement is even being made, you know? And so sometimes I have to say something, okay, if your house is on fire, it doesn't mean the other houses are not important, but your house is on fire needs the attention. You know, why is it though that we can't move away from just the one part, you know, perspective of, I am, I, I don't believe we should kill babies, but, it's, but I'm silent when it comes down to killing a, a life outside of the womb. How can we reconcile this um, when, when we're talking about we're believers that we can be just so focused or so compartmentalized mm -hmm. and not believe, like what you said, Pastor McGee, that God is interested in people. Yes. Yes. He is interested in people from the womb to the tomb. Mm -hmm. But why is it that as believers, not even as far as party lines, but as believers, why, how is it that we can be silent on life outside the womb, but be so passionate about, side, about life inside the womb only? And we say we're believers, and we say we love God and we love people. I do, again, I just think um, there is just a lot of salt, saltiness. Mm -hmm. I think we, we are losing... Um, I love for people and what the church is designed to do. I also, that's what I really think of. Some of the shift that's happening here is also, I think, that we're putting um, some of the emphasis that we should have on the church, on the government. And I think there's been a shift. So we're now we're expecting things that to be legislated of righteousness versus evangelized. Yes. Right? So we're, we're looking, so the church is looking for that shift. And I, I personally feel, as a pastor, more than ever, a greater push to evangelize, right? Um, and not try to work through government yes. to make the change that needs to be made. And I'm not saying as a, as a, a, a taxpaying citizen, there are expectations of, of protection, welfare, um, fairness, and all those things I expect from all the structures of government. Okay, right? So, but there is something that the church is being called to do that I think we're trying to regu re uh, regu re regulate down to the government. And I yes. think that's part of the issue as well. Yes. And because of that, I think our, the love of many are become wax cold because we're now shifting it and giving, making it a governmental responsibility. Uh, it's, 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 I want to use this as an analogy, and I hope it's a good one, because uh, I'm going to use it, so I hope it's good. <laughs> but this is why you see a slight, uh, uh, what I call a, a slight shift in the philosophy of law enforcement, or what they're trying to espouse out for law enforcement. Meaning, everything that law enforcement is being called out to do is not something that you need somebody with a taser and a gun. Right. So now they're saying, no, we need more social workers, people who can help people with mental illness and awareness on the scene because law enforcement is not really trained 
to come handle that matter. And so they're going to handle it from how they've been trained. This is the analogy I'm using because what happened is we shifted everything to be handled by law enforcement. Because I think this is part of the problem. Because now it becomes a trap even for those who are trying to bring something under order and they're really giving more power to it than is necessary. But somebody who's skillful understands somebody is in a manic, uh, a manic episode is going to totally handle it different. They're not focused on tasing them. They're not they understand where they are and some of the things they need to do to potentially get that person under control. I'm using that as an example of what I believe the church has done. We have passed responsibility to people who don't supposed to have it. And we're watching the tragedy and we're being manipulated. So I believe we need to retain our power. We need to start evangelizing. That's it. So let me, Apostle, you mentioned something about Black Lives Matter. And I just can't let this pass without what I was saying. That, um, that Black Lives Matter being stated does not ignore the fact that a whole lot, all lives matter. What it's saying to you is when you say all lives matter, remember that black lives That's should right. matter as well. True. And here's how I will give it to you. Scripturally, Luke 15. In Luke 15, there are three different situations happening. You have a lost coin, you have a yes. lost sheep, you have a lost boy. In each of those scenarios, what you see is there was a, a compassionate pursuit for recovery of the one that was lost. Right. And so what I look at that, I look at is that Jesus is concerned about all, including the one. That woman tore up her house to find right. that lost coin. It's the one he put 99 sheep away together, that one, in that regard. Pastor David said something that's so key, and it really is, I think, an indictment on today's local churches, is that we have become more impressed by how we move in the people, Doc, than by how, how people are getting saved. We're right. more concerned about how many people you sit in your chairs, how big is your parking lot, how big is your building, than about how many people actually are giving their life to Jesus. Do you understand that in today's time in the church, sidebar, but still relevant, today's church, that most churches now are not growing by conversion, they're growing by transient. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. What that means is that people are leaving this church or this church. There are some people in this city alone who are on three different church roads mm -hmm. because they didn't leave the previous church the right way. Right. And so while you're packing it out this Sunday, you, you're packing out with people who don't even belong to you. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, why is that important? That's important for this very reason. Because if we're not careful, and that's just time and time, I said this in a video I recorded for our church today, that our, our virtual audience has grown over the last eight months. Mm -hmm. Most churches can attest to that. Right. Having said that, their virtual audience growth is not who I'm called to. I'm grateful right. for them. Right. I am a shepherd by God's design over a sheep assigned to me. Right. The extra sheep that are coming on, they're going to be coming in and tapping in and eating out the sheepfold, but it ain't my job to feed them. Right. They right. make benefit off the, off the food yeah. for the sheep, but it ain't my yeah. job. Right. Now, why do I say that? Because if I if I am more concerned about how big my sheepfold looks right. than about, about the TLC I give them actual assigned sheep, then Ooh. I become more, more encouraged by gathering more sheep. But if you don't think about a shepherd, there's a book I call The Way of the Shepherd. One thing it says in the, about, about a shepherd is a shepherd every day goes out to the sheepfold, and he spends intimate time yes. with every one yeah. of the sheep. And here is why. Because if one sheep in the sheepfold gets an infection, all the sheep in that sheepfold wow. are in danger. My so God. Food, that's why they talk about, about the oil. The yes. oil on a sheep face yes. to make sure, because sheep can't wipe their face. Oil on a sheep face to make sure that buzz couldn't stick right. and, yes. and infect that sheep. That's why the oil was important. Right. Now, why is that important? We have lost the oil on head of the saints. Lord and so Lord. now things that shouldn't be sticking are sticking because our oil has dissolved. Not and not that right. is the danger that we are seeing is that we are allowing stained hands to apply holy oil on Lord the people help. of God. And we, because of that, we are now beholden to these people who are giving us, giving us compromised oil that's not holy. Remember this now, even though Saul was not God's design for Israel, God still used his prophet Samuel yeah. to anoint him. Right. It's important now. And the oil was head down, not feet up. Yeah. But God told Samuel, God told Samuel, go ahead and anoint him. It's not my choice, but go ahead and anoint him. Although Saul was appointed, God still anointed him. Right. Now this is important for us to understand because what we have done is we have fallen behind cliches that has no substance whatsoever. And it's the danger. We're seeing it even now. There are people that I know who are overwhelmingly fearful of November the 4th, not the 3rd. Wow. 
the morning yeah. after. Yes. Right. They're worried about facts. See. Because if this person wins, what's going to happen to this man? They're worried about that. And here's the bad thing about it. Most people I'm talking about are saints. Yes. Right. They're saints. Because what did, what did Apostle David say? We've lost our discernment. Right. The old saints were not educated by book, but they were strong in their discernment. Yes, they could yes. see in the lens of the spirit and call yes. out something. Yes, and then they could put their words together in the center. They could call out something yes. in a heartbeat. <laughs> now, today's saints, we have book knowledge and no discernment. No. And so now I can tell you somebody's resume, but I can't discern their spirit. But grandma can discern their spirit and know their resume. Uh, grandma will tell you, be, be careful of her. Yeah. Be careful of him. They yeah. 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 She called it out. Because yeah. she could see in the lens of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So we talked about other pastor, apostles about the Holy Spirit. Here is the danger of it, is that is that the church, we got to be careful of of, of 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 not desiring to sound deep, but have no roots. We're saying things yes. that sound deep for conversation that has no roots. The Holy Spirit was not an it. Or a thing, yes, part of the triune Godhead. Right. There's yes. a responsibility given to the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's important to understand. Yes. And so when we say I'm Holy Ghost filled, when Joe said and I said the same Holy Ghost, right. I can say that in confidence because I know we both have the Holy Spirit. Yes. That Holy Spirit cannot be relegated to the back row when I want to do wrong. Right. When I'm looking over a ballot, yes. Holy Ghost, I need your help. Yes. 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 I need you to help me see what yeah. I don't see in this regard. Yes. That help me to seek the lens of the spirit to know if this man or woman has a heart for you. Not saying, you know, I grew up in the church and, you know, and, and I've been in church my entire life. Okay, that sounds great for a campaign speech, but, but let me see their heart. <laughs> let me see their heart. And that's important. My last point on this for the saints of God is that we have to be more intentional about, about supporting or encouraging people who have the heart of God when they run for office. Yes. All times, people who have the heart for God are the ones who don't win. Mm -hmm. Because we've True. already compromised ourselves right. for the one who said the right thing to us. We, we'll come back to that, Apostle. Yeah. I, I can go there all night. I, I need it, sir. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is good. And, and this is conversation that we really do need to have. That And, and, and I agree with you. And how do we get as... As, as, as leaders and as the body of Christ, how do we get the power back? <laughs> because I think that's important. Because I agree, it's almost like if I don't allow you to teach my child this in school, it's okay, but I won't teach them at home. Yeah, right. You know, how do we get that power back so that we are not manipulated? So, so I'm, I'm going to jump and I'm going to let Apostle Davis finish because I know he wants to say something. This question is so important to me and here is why it's important. Because the answer I'm about to give you is, is emotional for me to give. The answer I'm about to give you is how we get the power back is we can't get the power back until we first admit we've lost it. Come on. And that's the danger is that, is that we, we don't even realize. Let me give it to you this way. Whenever the glory of the Lord fell in a place, you saw the results of the fall. You saw when that glory rested on that thing. You saw the, the results of that. Here is the danger of today's time. It's very possible that we are doing church or we're doing anything off of the residue that used to be there. Uh -huh. yes, not concerning that the glory has left the building. Yeah. And so it's hard to get back something that we can't acknowledge that we've lost. Right. And here, also because we have become more performance in the sanctuaries than actually recipients of the glory. And so as long as, because here's the thing now, I grew up Baptist, right? In the Baptist church, you give three points and a hoop. Right. And yeah. you preach. If you didn't hoop, you didn't preach. Right. right. Right? So now you got bad preachers with a good hoop. Come on. Yeah. They gave you no substance, but they gave you a great celebration. Right. And so because because of that, we are more, our ears are more inclined to the celebration than it is to the substance. Right. But guess what, ladies and gentlemen, you can't survive off celebration. Right. Substance hits your core. Celebration gets you emotional. Yeah. And so any good, sound, biblical teacher will tell you celebration will come after. But sometimes you don't need celebration. Right. The substance is right. Yeah. right. Now, listen, I grew up, I'm a city boy. So there's certain things I've never eaten before when I got to the South, right? Certainly I just never ate before. But here's the thing. When you have a good meal mm -hmm. and it makes you feel good, a good meal changes everything about you. You ate something real good, and I usually have the energy to do anything else but to sit down. Because yeah. it's good to your core. Right. Yes. The problem, though, is, is, is that we have lost the power based on the power that's been given by the Spirit of God. We don't recognize it. 
Because we're still doing the same same turning of the wheel, trying to trying to trying to trying to turn that oil back together again. Then that we're actually doing, and the people have now become. It's going to sound insulting. People have now become illiterate to what the truth of the word of God is. So now they don't even realize that this is false. Right. And so now we're getting we get years okay. of 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 bad leadership because the people can't discern there's a bad leader before us. And so, Apostle, it's hard to get back something that we, we, we don't admit that we first lost it. And, and I'll tell you, it makes me emotional because those of us who have a heart for the things of God, we see it. Yes. We absolutely see that there is no oil there. There is no power there, but the people don't see it. Yes. And then what happens is, is that years go by, they finally see it, and now the wounded, depleted people are coming to us. Asking us to help them get hold of you. Yeah. And now you got to spend years yes. trying to Reach revive them, restore them. Think about David. David had 600 men that God really assigned him. David had the men who were discontented, indebted, distressed, depressed. He, but God used those men with David to do great things. Yeah. These are people that, 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 that everybody else had cast aside. David used these men yeah. for the glory of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, these people are in our churches today. Yes. Right, but but if Apostle Lyons, Apostle Davis, Pastor McGee can't discern that we have some sheep in our sheepfold that are wounded, mm -hmm. then what I'm doing is is that I'm giving a a word up here to a person that's depleted down here. They can't handle it, and I got to spend more time down here trying to pull them up. And and, and so you can't do that without power. So what I what most people do, Apostle is. Is, is they don't want to deal with this because if I deal with this, it's going to expose I don't have the power anymore. So I send them over to Joe. So that's on you now. <laughs> I only want those who going to holler when I holler. Who going to run when I shout. I only want those people. I don't want the ones that's going to require, that's going to, that's going to pull from me what's inside of me. Right? right? When, when a woman touched Jesus with the Bible says him, Bible says Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? Yes. Now a crowd is around him. Yes. He didn't ask the question of who bumped me. He said, who touched me? Because she touched him out of her knee. Yeah. And he stopped and turned and said, who touched me? Yeah. And that's important to understand that her touch was so powerful that Jesus himself felt virtue leave his body. Yes. Now, from a power standpoint, is maybe you, know, you don't feel nobody touching you because the power isn't there. Mm. It's on you, bro. <laughs> I didn't set you up. You don't pass the baton. <laughs> Throw it. You got it. And I think Everything that has even happened in 2020 has really uh, should have um, reminded the church of how important it is to repent on behalf of the nation. Everything that has happened in 2020 yes. should have reminded the loss of life, the change of our everyday structure. Um, if you notice, everything went back to its rightful owners. Um, no longer was it about what are the teachers going to do for my child? It became what I'm going to do for my child. Right. You know, <laughs> and the, and now parents were faced with responsibilities that we had the whole time that we had delegated too much authority over to someone else. Wow. So I think 2020 has tried to rebuke us for the good, has tried to correct us for the good. God's sovereignty, right? Not saying God did COVID, but God is not lazy, meaning. God takes advantage of everything for his good purpose, yeah. right? He's, I use the word God's not lazy. So God takes advantage of everything for his good purpose. He doesn't do everything. The Bible tells us that too. He's not the author of confusion, right? But it don't mean he won't come in confusion and do do a great work, right? So God has still been My trying to God. do that. I, I also think as a part of getting the power back, something that happened to me when, when I was watching the debate, uh, the first debate, now the second debate, you probably needed to pray for me because I kind of <laughs> kind of got off off track. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but on the first debate, I was I was focused, right? And, and, and I won't talk about the second debate. I, I, but the first debate, as I began to watch it, I began to feel a great uh, level of sadness. Um, one because. Be very honestly, for me, this is my, my opinion, and no reflection of the church I lead or anyone else. But my opinion, I became uh, very sad about both choices for presidency, um, Biden and Trump. I became sad about both of them. And I became sad that America 
was fighting over th those two people for the most part. That that what saddened me is out of all the leadership that's in this world, out of all the leadership that's in this world, it manipulated us to the point that we were fighting over crumbs. And that's what I believe. Now I don't believe that Biden is terrible and Trump is just all terrible. But I just don't. I just know that's not a best what America has. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. see, I was. That's, and, and that's the sadness that I felt at that moment. That, my God, we have gotten sucked in, and I don't mean this in any disrespect, but please allow me to say it. I don't mean in no disrespect. I believe people can have a long career and still be sharp. But I said, I can't believe we're fighting over two people in their 70s. That's what I, I said. just can't believe it. And That's I don't mean that you can't be sharp in your 70s, but That's normally it. in your 70s, you're not trying to lead one of the greatest nations or one of the nations that want to be great. That could just be me. I could be wow. misguided. But I just believe, are, is this what we're really fighting over, right? So one of these, when I was watching, I feel the Holy Spirit says, because, you know, that first debate was crazy, right? Everybody knows the first yeah, debate was yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. It, was like, it was like, what is this, right? <laughs> but the Holy Spirit told me, watch the whole thing, because I need you to grieve for America. And I need you to watch it. Don't get aggravated, because many people are aggravated. People are like, I turned it off. Ten minutes. God said, I want you to watch it. Because I want you to be frustrated, and I need you to be grieved. Because I need you to go deeper than surface level now. I need you to be beyond media spins and pundits and, and all of the other things that come in our ear gates. God said, I need you to go deeper now. And I need you to be grieved like I'm grieved. And I'll begin to watch it from a different perspective saying, oh my God, this is the chaos that we're involved in. And I think that's why it's important for the church to arise and to speak truth to power. I think it's time for us to arise and speak truth to the power. I think the evangelicals need to get their voice back. I think they gave it away. I think they gave it away for a good cause, but they, they didn't manage it, right? So I don't necessarily fault the evangelicals for standing up for uh, uh, abortion, for traditional family values. I don't, I don't, but I think they mismanaged it. I think what happens is when, when you become uh, too interested in power, and what it has done for you, and the recognition you potentially have received. You know, committing what's happened to many people are developing what is called a PAC, right? And it's actually almost uh, it's, it's a coalition, a committee, all right? And so, but you got so interested in power, I think you missed God's assignment. And I think my prayer for the evangelical group is that they will get back to an assignment that hears the voice of God. Because I really believe that part of what they have is a part of the heart of God. All right? So I dare not try to act like everything is bad, because I think we're missing that as well. And I'm going to say that. And I don't know if that was my question that I'm answering, but I'm going to say that. <laughs> like, I like to be on point. I can't stand people who also be off tangents and be like, that's not the question, so If it don't even relate, I can't stand it. So I want to make sure. But I, I wanted to say this before. But I want to be careful that because we have been become so manipulated that we don't trample God's values. I've heard people say, why are we trying to tell a woman what to do with her body? When we talk about abortion, we got to talk about it with a little more reverence. We're not saying, and I'm hear me clearly, and I'm going to say this, we're not talking about a woman getting a tattoo do with her body. We're not talking about uh, uh, physical enhancement. We're talking about how God brings leaders into the world. We're talking about how God brings people into the world. This is a reverential, sacred, divine process. Even if it happened on a one-night stand, the whole process of conception is divine by God. And we cannot just re regulate it and downgrade it to who are we to tell a woman what we need to do with her body. There needs to be some other avenues for that. And so I think that's when you start protecting women, supporting women. For me, the whole issue of abortion has made me respect motherhood more. So, so one of the things it makes me do is respect what mothers go through to bring about creation. It makes me, it makes me uh, to respect a woman's body, right? It makes me start respecting her and who she is. So there's other aspects of this pro-life that we need to raise up. And there are other protections and vulnerabilities that happen with women that I think we need to care for as well. 
So I think this is an opportunity to care for women, right? And not just to be talking about not telling them what to do with the body. Because I, I think we're about to trample over something that God cares for when we talk about the issue of abortion. And I think we have to be careful of that, all right? So I wanted to say that. Yes. Amen. And, and, and that, is, that is good. I, I want to make a statement here, and then I'm going to get back to my couple of other questions. Um, because, and I, I, I think Pastor McGee, you, you, you really... Uh, pointed it out. Why is it that the Holy Spirit is not causing us and moving us to repentance? And I think that's something we really need to pray for and take a look at. That we can't ever, and, and I'm getting to my next question about how do we heal the divide. We can't ever get there if the Holy Spirit can't convict us. See, we've got our ideology, we got our platforms, we got our, you know, all our, our political views, and, 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 and we've become just so divisive. I Pastor Joe's spirit jumped on me and I was on I was listening to a particular prophet. And basically, um, this prophet said, um, you cannot be Christian or if you are, you're ignorant if you vote Democrat. Mm -hmm. and, he, and so he basically, he, he specifically said that you, ain't no way you could be a Christian and be a Democrat. Mm -hmm. And I decided to come in. <laughs> and, I, and I went, of course, to Psalms 89 and 14, where it says, I said, righteousness and justice flows from the throne of God. He is neither Democrat nor Republican, you know, and I went on to say we must teach the a, a balanced gospel and not our political perspective. That was my comment. I had a person. Uh, looks like he stepped on your toes. He was not teach, preaching the gospel. He was just edifying you through the word. And I said, duh. That's not teaching the gospel, and he went on to, and you know, he went on to say, you know, it's no way possible. And this person echoed what the prophet said: there's no way possible you can be a Christian and be a Democrat. And I was like, God, it was sad to, uh, you know, to hear this. And so, of course, Pastor Joe Spirit was still on me. So I said, um, no, my told. My toes it, were not stepped on. I was still, I was just uh, merely stating my perspective. And I said, and for the record, like I stated before, we must teach a balanced gospel. God is interested with life from the womb to the tomb. And I said, and if we can't embrace that, Regardless of our political affiliation, what has happened to us? You know, and so uh, then, of course, then the person comes back and he reveals his, his heart. And I say, and you really have revealed your heart. And he said, so then, who are you voting for? I didn't respond because that wasn't the point. You know, then, of course, you know, you got other people that are agitated. They say, fool, he told you he didn't believe in no party. <laughs> you know, you got those that'll fight for you. But my point is, we have been so divided that the one thing, guys, if we don't hear anything we're talking about tonight, God is love. Yes. And I don't care on either side. If I, whatever I say, if it's not from a place of love, I'm in error. And I must repent. And we don't want to deal with this. We don't want to deal with, I can have a perspective, I can have something that's important to me. You know, uh, early on as a prophet, and the reason I've been concerned and wanted to have this conversation is because a lot of stuff, and I'm comfortable to say, and I told him, I'm comfortable enough as a believer that I don't have to agree with the majority. And I'm okay with that. That because I know a lot of times prophets are not popular. And we don't jump on bandwagons just because everybody else is on it and saying it. 
And so, um, because even, like you said, Pastor Joe, with this, God knows how to use circumstances. Mm -hmm. And we're going to miss God and we're going to miss the benefit of this season if we don't repent. Mm -hmm. You know, George Floyd was prophetic. The thing, last thing he was saying, I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. What is COVID dealing with? It's respiratory. It's dealing with our breath. God, when he breathed into man, he breathed into him the breath of life. And man became a living soul. We're in a season where it's about the breath of God. Whether it's in the womb or to the tomb, it's about the breath of God. And as prophets, if we are not declaring that, not our political views and what's dear to us, because we need both sides. You know, we need all of it. We need, we need you to be concerned about abortion, but we also need you to be concerned about life outside of that. We need to understand based on the Bible what the word says concerning marriage. What he, but I see, though, social justice issues are just as important, and we have to address them. Oh, with that being said, how do we now start? Because I know we can talk about the differences. How do we begin to start uh, dealing with and, and, and mending the divide? I'm starting to see some of it. Now, sometime again, I go back to this this this, this national local thing yes, that sir. I always yes, do. Sir. That's the one thing you will always hear me talk I about. Do. So you want to hear me hear me talk? I'm always going to talk about that national. Because sometimes we look for stuff at the national Right. Rather than starting at the local, I agree with you. And so I'll just say I'm start. I had a conversation at work that I never had with my boss, who we have a very loving relationship, very great relationship. Uh, white lady, beautiful, sweet spirit, Christian, just good person overall. But for the first time, during because of the pressures of the world, we had a conversation at work about race. Never in the history of me being in that office, and I've been in the office many years, known her for a while, and I was the one uncomfortable. Not that I couldn't have it, but I was uncomfortable because she brought the conversation to me. So I was a little taken back by it, you know, because um, I know we all always talk about stuff. <laughs> yeah. But he was somebody bringing it to me, and I was like, are you, are you ready for this? You know, that was kind of like my thing. And she was looking at me like, are you ready for this? You know, and we were able to have a conversation about race, yes. about racial relations, about how it affects the office, about how it affects the, the work. And now that we have a problem in our office, because I think we have a wonderful office that we've managed, and it's great. But uh, just overall discussions about uh, promotion and work and systemic issues that can happen in the local. So for me, I saw that as a win, because as, as great as I thought our relationship is and was, we had never went into more intimate, what I call, conversations and that was what I call a more intimate personal conversation where we were able to respect perspectives mostly we agreed on mostly all things anyway yes. um, that's why we work together so well but at the same time I start to see that we can be a part of the healing and we start with love approaching these hard conversations yeah. and need to have conversations and so for me I've tried to of make, and one of the things, again, I'm normally having those conversations, but it's normally with people I think are ready for it, yeah. right? And so <laughs> and that's where the challenge is. And so now I have been taking up the conversation with people I think are not ready for it, but they need it. Yeah. And that's been the new challenge, is to have those conversations with people who need it most. And that's where I believe uh, we can start engaging healing. So I want to say that I'm seeing some parts of, of course, we need more of it. But many things, I, this is what, what happened. See, and this is the pioneer in me. All right, because you can never get the ball rolling if you don't ever honor what's good happening, right? So there are people who say, I'm not going to do anything because they don't think nothing's happening. So you got to show people where the small measurements of progress are happening so they can participate there. It's the snowball effect. And so I'm normally always working on the snowball effect because I understand you don't despise fall beginning. So that's where I see healing happening. I see some some people saying, hey, I, I love my brothers and sisters and things of that nature. I've been against these conversations and these posts 
that's been by African Americans. I'll be yes. very honest. I'm aggravated with some of y'all <laughs> that's putting on your posts and your timeline, dear white people. Dear white people, I'm so tired of these posts talking about dear white people um, as if everybody who's uh, in a white skin or Caucasian think the same, just as the same that we don't want everybody who is in a dark skin to think that we are certain types of way. That people are diverse, and for us to even start this yeah. dear white people conversation as if all white people think alike, we're it's in divisive. error. It's divisive. divisive in itself. And it just aggravates me. So if you're doing it, stop it, please. <laughs> Church said amen. 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 <laughs> so I, listen, so um, every Sunday when I was growing up, every Sunday my grandmother, who rests with the Lord now, would, would cook a big meal. And it was not up for compromise or, or conversation every Sunday after we left church that the entire family would go to my grandparents' house. My mom, her siblings, all the grandchildren. Um, and my grandmother would cook on sun, on Saturday for Sunday. She believed that you don't cook on Sunday. That's you right. iron your clothes on Sunday. <laughs> yes. Like, sure, I'll be you be you a sidebar, I'm sorry. <laughs> I was doing that way Real too, bro. Bro. And yes. so, so my, my grandma made a big meal and, and we would go, we'd go there for, for dinner, and, and it was a certain order by which how you ate, who went first, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And we would eat, and you know, the kids would go outside, we would play, have a good time. Every Sunday, some of us got into a spat with each other. Now, we're blood relatives. We're getting into spats over a basketball, whatever it may be, we got into a spat. But the following Sunday, we were back together again because, because it was grandma's order, we're all going to get together on Sunday. Every Sunday, this was going to happen to the point I looked forward to it when I was much younger growing up because it was a time for us to come together. I bring you that story for this reason. I also learned in that that one of the greatest ways to ever resolve matters is at a table with a meal between. Yes, yes, yes sir. I saw that growing up. I didn't appreciate it until I got older, but I realized it's hard for you. It's not impossible, but it's hard for you. Or it's hard for me to hate you or despise you greatly when you sit in front of my face. We start having these conversations. But there's something that I think is so key, and, and Joe started saying it, and I want to hit it hard, is, is that we have to, as a people, we really want to deal with reconciliation and get rid of the divide. We have to be okay with having that conversation with people who don't think like us. Yes. It is so easy to congregate around people who think just like you, there is no work in that at all. Right. But to sit down with somebody who doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you, and engage in that conversation, it's okay. Because here is the fact of the matter. To the core of your differences, we have this in common. I don't know if we're human being, we're made in the image of God. Start there and you build out, but it's so key. And the thing that Joe keeps saying that my wife who's watching and people from my church who are watching will tell you that I always talk about national politics irritate me, but local politics impact me. Now, why do I say that? Because we're so nationally yes. focused that we're locally ignorant. Mm -hmm. We're not focusing on, you look at our ballot, you don't know who's running for judge, right. who's running for commission. We don't understand it. Let me hit this point hard. Presidents don't, don't don't enact, nor do they pass laws. Right. That's Congress. Mm -hmm. Governors don't do that. That's legislatures. Right. Mayors don't do that. That's commissions, right? And so while we're focused on who's going to be in the White House, we're allowing other people to get in through their congressional lenses, and we're ignoring them. Mm -hmm. You realize yes. you're really worried about the impact on black lives or lives in general? J judicial candidates have a greater impact. Yes. Right. Yeah. on the life of a, a man or woman every day than a president ever will. By the time what happens in D.C. hits us in Tallahassee, it has been watered down greatly. Now, if you're watching the news every day, your world's coming to an end. <laughs> the truth be told, by the time it actually impacts you, it's, great, it's, it's a great water down. But what happened at, at City Hall, that has immediate impact on what's going to happen to your everyday living. If they change that tax roll, yeah. if they increase anything upon you, you're going to feel that. Now, why is that important? Because in the pro I work in the political process. I've been doing this for 20 plus years now. And Joe works in a political process. Well, he had been to the night, works for the government, so it's a political process. Absolutely. What we can tell you is, is there is no way you can do your job effectively if all you're going to deal with is black people. Right. It's unrealistic. Right. You have to deal with, with men and women of all races. You have to. 
Now, now, the common denominator in every one of Joe's conversations with people is that he's Joe Davis, right? That's the common denominator, that he is in every one of these conversations. Each person may change, he's the same person. And so, if he keeps changing how he engages people based on what he's talking to, the problem is no longer them, it's him. Because he's trying now to appease everybody. My point in all that is, is the question I would ask is, when was the last time any of us made an, an intention to converse with people who don't think like us? Because here's what's going on. Just today, I was sitting in the car out there, I was looking at pictures of the day's um, social pole march from Bethel Baptist to, to, to where it ended up. And I, they show one picture of the people marching past a restaurant. They show four white college students from FSU, one who was shooting a bird, and they were, they were yelling Trump, right? And I, I look at the picture, and I started laughing at the picture for this reason. I started laughing because it's become so divisive. Yes. So I have to position myself in a place so that you can see me, hear me, and, and see how I, I feel about what you're doing versus me and that person, whoever those people may be sitting now having a conversation, kind of realization, I may not change you. And I'm okay with that. But here is why I look I, I, I do look like that way. Since the George Floyd incident, Apostle, I have been in, I have been engaged in more conversations with, with white colleagues than ever before because they just didn't understand. But I posted my Facebook page and I used my son, who's 14, as as why I did it. Because I was watching, I was reading an article about what happened. They said about the article and the video started playing, couldn't even stop it. I'm watching this video. And you know, if I'm in my son having this conversation. My son is asking me, why are, why are people marching? It's not going to change anything. Because my son at 14 doesn't understand the history of marching. We're having this conversation back and forth. And I put a post out there, and I was very emotional in the post. I usually don't post things like that. But I'm so exhausted by it. One of my white colleagues started engaging me in a conversation, and, I, and they're trying to really understand why this one hit so hard. And I said, here is why. I said, because every black male in America saw themselves with that knee on their neck. And every black mother saw that being their child. And I said, I said, it's hard for you to get it when you've never been profiled. Right? We went through the overall point. And, and I used to say things like, it's not my job to make you feel comfortable with this. And it's not my job. Yeah. But, it's, but it is my job, if you, if you want to know, to start educating you. Right. Joe used to get with him and his supervisor in that conversation. Right? right? Now, now, there are certain places we're going to have this conversation. I've been actually coming to many, to many settings and, and help, help kind of research and watch people do interviews. And I would say to people this, you can't convince me you want diversity when your interviewing community is all white. That committee by itself tells me you're not sincere about diversity. It makes no sense to me at all. But here's the thing now. <laughs> because of who I am, I'm okay with calling that out. But there are many people who see it, don't agree with it, but they're silent about it. Right. My point of all that is, here's how we deal with the divide, is that we, we can no longer be silent. Yes. But how we speak, as he said, it can't be in general, it has to be very specific. Hey, white people is very general. Right. Now, me, now me calling it out, but also I got to call out my own. Yes. Call out my own. This, this is important yes. for us to understand. From the church's lens, though, we have to stop mishandling the text. Yes. We have to stop it. You go back to slavery, you understand yeah. that, the, that the people under the white robes were sometimes deacons and pastors yes. and bank presidents, yes. and you identify them based on their shoes. Yeah. Hmm. These were pastors preaching the word of God on Sunday, wearing a white robe, burning a cross in your yard that night. And, and people knew what was wrong, but guess what? They found one verse in all the text, and they sat on it. And I'm saying to us, this is from a leadership standpoint, that 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 we can't create we can't create reconciliation from a leadership standpoint until leaders first reconcile. Yes. Yeah. There's too much divide amongst leaders. Yes, because remember this now, I say this to my church all the time. That membership will always follow the example of leadership, good or bad. Yes. And so if they if they hear Joe Davis. Lee Lyon, Derek McGee speaking ill about a white pastor, we have now given them permission to do the same exact thing. Exactly. I may not agree with how you run your church, right. right? It's not my job to touch your call. Mm -hmm. That's on God, right? right? But, but what we're doing is, is that we are divided. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
yeah. amongst leaders. And so now we're talking about how do we reconcile it. We have to first repent yeah. as leaders. We have to now be intentional about reconciliation because people will follow in that regard. People, do you understand that, that, that there are people who get mad when white walk into their black church? Mm -hmm. Let me remind people, heaven ain't all black. Yeah. <laughs> Let's be here now. It, it ain't all black. Right? Do you, let me go, it's funny, but it's serious. Most black churches in America now are doing church in white time. What about that? Because before COVID, we did church two, two and a half hours every Sunday. White churches do church in an hour. Now, because of COVID, through your virtual, you're probably doing church in an hour and five. We're learning that we can, we can, we can, we can have great praise and worship, prophetic word, preach the word hard, and be done in an hour. We're now, we're now entering in where they've already been. But here's what I'm saying to you. The word didn't change. We just not, we start doing all that extra stuff. Mm -hmm. And what I'm saying is, when we get beyond the extra and get intentional, we'll come to the realization, let's figure out where we're coming at. Let's deal with the, the differences. Now, now because of Joe's foundation with a supervisor, now it's, 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 it's to a different realm now. And so now, there's now a different level of conversation they can have going forward because they tapped into it. Now, if Joe has shut that conversation down, and that's what we're doing sometimes, is that, is that we're so angry at what we're seeing nationally that we're not locally impactful. We're not locally impactful. We're not seeing what's going on. I want to be safe in my community. I want my kids to feel safe when they go outside in the front yard. My white neighbor was the same exact thing. I'm certain of it. Okay, we have that in common. Do we have that in common? Can we start there and build out? Right? The things that we can be coming on, we don't I, don't I don't have to be divisive because you have a Trump sign and you have a Biden sign. Why does that become the divide? Mm -hmm. When you don't know Trump or Biden personally. Amen. <laughs> Glory. And this is good. This is good. And we've got to bring it to a close. But before we do that, I wanted to ask if there was anybody online or you know, in our students in the audience, if there were some additional questions that you may have that uh, approaching an area that we didn't address, if there's anyone online that may have a question that you would like to see answered in the class, if there any any areas that you would like the panel. Well, well Apostle, to, can I ask a question? Sure. Let people have it. Before we started, you and I were engaging in a personal conversation, and I just think for the viewing audience, it would be very beneficial um, for them to hear this. You mentioned earlier about about the prophetic. Yes, we're having this conversation. I think it would be important because also because of the class that you do, I think it would be important to educate people on what the what the responsibility of the prophet really is. Because most people are only know profits based on promises of cars and houses yeah. and land. And, and so I think that's important because there are people who are viewing, people from my church as well who are viewing, who, who are not familiar with what that responsibility is. So all they see is the handkerchiefs and the, and the holy water. They don't know what that really is. So they don't really appreciate the prophet or the apostle. Amen. Well, just, just real briefly, uh, what my heart and, and where this discussion really came from is, I, I, I've listened to it and I make a habit of because I want to hear what it is that others are saying that God is saying. Mm -hmm. And so I listen to a lot of prophetic words from others um, and, 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 and not to be critical, but we have to judge it based on scripture. And as I was just listening, I started hearing more of a partisan line in the prophetic and not the heart of God. I would hear parts of God and then their personal views. Like for example, uh, in my class, we talked about one time a young man had a couple of dreams and in the dreams, um, the Lord showed him some things about that was gonna happen with the chaos, uh, the two or three months leading up to the election. You know, but then his advice to them was um, buy guns and ammunition. But then the scripture says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so I begin to say, God, as prophets, if our job is to build up, exhort, encourage, give direction and, and clarity according to your will, 
We can't be biased in our personal views. We've got to, if God is giving us a word to release to the body or to the world, we've got to do it objectively based on what God says and not based on my personal bent. You know, whether I'm Democrat or Republican, I must declare the word of God and keep me out of it. Because if that word doesn't come to pass, I just misrepresented God Amen. to the world. And that's all people will remember. Mm -hmm. And so the purpose of this and the purpose of even this discussion is whether I'm Republican or Democrat, um, it doesn't matter. What is God really saying? And what God is really saying is a house divided against itself can't stand. Amen. What he's saying is the church is not being the light of the world. Because if the church is being the light of the world, we will put our even political views aside and seek the yes. face of God, yes. repent, and turn so he can heal our land. Yes. Because to be real honest with you, it doesn't matter who's going to be in the White House. God is still God. Right. And we've got to understand that, but we cannot misrepresent the prophetic and use that office for political gain, for personal gain, for grants or anything, or, 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 or you visit to the White House or nothing. We've got to do it because this is what God is saying. And so, like what you said, we've got to kill the lust for ministry. We've got to kill the lust for power, lust the lust for position. Yeah. I'm getting something out of this, so I will side with everything that's being said because it sounds politically correct when that's not the heart of God. The heart of God is redemptive in nature. And that's and we whatever we say, it must be done out of love. It must be done to bring people back to the heart of God and have them on their face to cry out to God and not for a political position. And so that's even tonight, that was the purpose of this discussion, is to let people know what's the heart of God on this. Yes, we are supposed to affect nations, but we still must do it with the character of God. And God is love. And everything that exudes out of him is love. And so if it doesn't, we're out of order. If you're, uh, if you're a Democrat and you're picking up uh, Trump signs out of people's yards, you're wrong. Yeah. <laughs> or vice versa. You're wrong. If you can't talk with somebody that has a different view than you as a believer, you're wrong. You're immature, and we have to address this. You know, I understand that how sometimes we are saying black lives matter when we kill each other. That's another discussion for another day that I want to have, that we want people to respect our lives, but we don't respect our lives in a lot of instances. We've got to have these type of questions of, of conversations that is not okay. If we want somebody else to respect our lives, we must respect it as well. And I'm sorry, entertainment, media, others, those are not the persons that I look up to for guidance and direction for my life. Yeah. I must look, as believers, we must look to the word of God and Jesus Christ. Right. See, and, and, and you guys, earlier, you were so correct in what you said. We're looking to entertainers mm -hmm. to dictate to us how we should vote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, we need to be informed and educated, but then vote based on, as we've been praying for, I'm like you, I'm in the ballot box today, Father. <laughs> you know, wh which direction should I go? Because it's a spiritual matter. And I'm still a believer even when I'm doing my ballot. So that was the purpose uh, that, of this, that we can't abuse the gift that God has given us and use our influence incorrectly. There are a lot of things that I've heard that, that quote, unquote, people are saying God is saying, and I'm telling you he is not saying it. <laughs> I'm telling you that. How do I know it? Because I look at the scriptures. God sent prophets to kings to correct. Prophets don't ignore character. Why? Because uh, your word is coming from a defiled place. The fruit of the spirit. You hear me? If the spirit of God dwells in us, there is evidence in our life called the fruit of the spirit. That he is in our life. And we must operate and, and exist and speak and communicate from that place. If not, 
the message is tainted. Regardless of anybody. And we have to understand that. So as believers, we've got to get back to who really is representing us well based on scripture. And we just got to be willing to say, if there's nobody there, like you said, we've got to start locally. No, we've got to put people. I told my church the other day, I said, we've got to do a better job of raising up doctors and lawyers and politicians with the right heart posture, those that are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. And we just, and, 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 and infiltrate all of these systems of the world and, and not just want them to be prophets and the pastors and teachers and it's you know in the church arena but we've got to teach them to go and evangelize the world to be effective in the world and so that was the purpose of this conversation and I believe it has been very effective and I believe we've got some people online that's really thinking that's been listening even in the audience and so before I know, I, we've been on, you know, for about an hour and a half, an hour, and I know our time, but are there any other questions? Are y'all have any, maybe on your line, that any questions that haven't been answered that someone uh, wants answered? Uh, some of the students over there. I do. Um, okay. I think it's important for us to understand that the Bible is not one of the, and I used, I had to find the right word to describe what I was dealing with um, during this um, election and this political climate that we're in right now. And I had to use the word irritation because I didn't want to say I was confused. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to say that I was frustrated. I didn't want to use words of that nature. I was just irritated. Okay. And my irritation came from the fact that I was hearing all these uh, all of these prophetic words, um, and as I began to listen at, at them, I began to go back and research. Um, yeah. Okay. I began to go back and research uh, these prophets, the prophetic words that they're giving now in 2020 pertaining to one particular political uh, person, I said, well, let me go back and see what their prophetic word was with others. Yeah. <laughs> so I went back yeah. and I couldn't find many. Right. Right. Um, and that concerned right. me, yes. that right. really concerned me. Absolutely. So I said, how is it, Lord? And I was talking to the Lord. I said, Lord, how is it that you're speaking one dimensional way? Yes. Wow. You're not giving clarity um, in a balanced format that is just one dimensional and there's too much of a personal influence in these prophetic words. One of the things that God really, and y'all kind of cleared it up for me a whole lot tonight. I just was sitting here smiling because when you say uh, on the prophetic, when God uh, spoke in Ezekiel uh, 22 and verse 30, he said, and I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land that I should not destroy it but I found none. That's the prophetic voice. Yes. That's the prophet. That's what prophecy is. Yes. It is a prophet that stands in the gap. Yes. That stands. It is also intercession. That's right. An intercessor stands to be able to yes. mediate between what God desires to do um, and and be able to influence Him otherwise, because you can change the mind of God. So when you talk about the prophetic voice. You talk about a voice that, a, that is able to stand in the gap, that is able to speak the mind of God, yes. the mind of God, not, uh, not the, um, uh, um, the influential thoughts of yourself. Because God could be speaking in some of those prophetic words, but they have co-mingled their own oh. agenda with, with whatever word that God had given. Yes. So I was irritated, and I have been... I was irritated to the point that my family was noticing it because I'm sitting where I usually study and, and pray at and they're wondering what's going on. I, I couldn't find the words when I was talking to my husband and I didn't want to speak the wrong words. So I just used the word. I said, I'm just irritated. I'm irritated because I'm reading what um, men of God are saying at this time, but it's not agreeing with what my spirit is, 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 is picking up. 
And how can you say that this is God's mind and this is God's way mm -hmm. when it does not line up with character? Yeah. Right. Yes. And so tonight has really been great. It's, it's been good. good because you all have answered quite a few questions. Good. And that's good. And guys, if this is the thing uh, that we have to understand when it comes to the prophetic and when it comes to us as agents, whether it's the prophetic or it's, a, it's a pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, anybody in those positions, we must line ourselves up based on the word of God. Not what's popular, not what anybody else is saying or doing. It must line up with the word. And if not, God has to deal with us. And my concern is, and, why, and I started praying, I'm like, God, when you start dealing with these prophets, you know, grace. I started praying grace because we cannot ever um, you misuse our influence or position because Pastor McGee I like the way you said it you're giving when you're talking you're speaking for your personal perspective and not as from your church and I think we've seen a lot of misuse where we're basically telling our churches this is how you should vote and we are convincing them based on scripture and we it must be balanced and I haven't just seen in a lot of that was just I was irritated and grieving my heart because I'm saying, God, this is not about Democrat, Republican, some of the issues. I say, because all of them are important. Right. I'm interested in life from the womb to the tomb, not just one aspect of it. And why are we cited on certain parts and we are really, uh, uh, you know, we, we want to get involved only on a certain part. We've got to have these conversations and stuff. And so that's how this started. And so I'm just grateful to Apostle Joe Davis and Pastor Derek McGee for coming yes. to our class and just yes. us being able to have this conversation and this discussion. And I believe those online have really been impacted and have blessed as well because some of the comments that I'm seeing, they're saying thank you for this informative conversation. Others had excellent conversations. Uh, and so, and we've had a good number uh, on that have been um, watching. And so I want to thank you all for just taking your time out to uh, come and be with us tonight in our Apostolic Prophetic Training Absolutely. Institute. Amen. Amen. Um, any other questions in the audience here? Anything, other statements? Um, I just want to encourage us to vote. That's right. Tuesday. If you have not voted already, vote on Tuesday. Be prayerful. Vote your country. Do not get pulled into the climate of the culture. Mm -hmm. You know, because, and, and, and this is another class, sometimes even as prophets, you have to realize, understand what, which arena uh, you're prophesying from. You know, because sometimes we are not prophesying from the third heaven where God is. <laughs> uh, and so we have to understand that. But that's a whole other discussion but again I want to thank all those that are online that have been listening to us I want to again thank Pastor McGee and Apostle Joe we appreciate you um, Elevate Church uh, Deacon Chris for being here thank you Dr. T thank you for just opening up the building that for us to have the discussion and uh, again vote okay. any last words before we go I still want to advocate for of the need to pray. I feel with this climate and the things that have been done, the words that have been said, the atrocities that have been done over this election, I feel a very strong intercession that's necessary for whoever wins on whatever side because I still feel a very strong intercession that's going to be necessary. And the church must recognize that we're going to have to watch our words. Pastors going to have to be very sensitive in the book, and a lot of pastors are just as guilty as uh, Pastor McGee really was heavy on tonight. His grace is he was very strong on that, on that, especially at that pastoral level. And I must echo it, but because I really believe we're going to be have to be careful with our words, I agree. because we're going to really have to watch what happens after this election. One of the things about this election, I'm saying this because um, deception has been at an all time high. You've yes. never ever heard. I mean, they've always had fact checking, but fact checking has like skyrocketed. The need to, to fact check because there are so many lies being told, and that's manipulation. And I believe because of that, 
people, there are people who believe st stuff that's not even true. Um, and that's one of the things I was talking about a little bit earlier. Let me get out of here. But it's normally, I, I'm the kind of person, I jump inside of, of threads. So I'm on Facebook, I'm on Fox page, I'm on other pages, and I'm in the threads. So you may see Pastor Joe one day in these threads, and I go at it. I can hold my own. I can handle these conversations. Because I already know I love people. So I already know I can talk because I know I'm going to love people. And I may be talking to a child of God. So I, can, I have to respect people. But I'm in these threads. And I'm in these conversations trying to deal with the core root issue. But I, I want us as people of God to be ready to help this world heal and yes. find God. And I think we need to be ready for that. Even if, whether we're disappointed or not or whether we get the candidates of our choice. We need to be ready to make sure that we can help the common good of all men. So I really want to say that we really need to make sure we're here to see. That's good. Amen. Uh, again, thank you for listening. Thank you for being a part of this. And I, I, I do want to say prophetically, I, I agree with my brothers that it's time for us to pray. And it's time for us as leaders to be mindful of the words that we are speaking. For there are some leaders that will lose influence in this season because of the words that have been spoken. There are leaders that God will raise up others and take you down and use you as placeholders until your um, Davids are developed because we are, we are misrepresenting God in a season where the sheep need a shepherd. Where the sheep need to know where green pastures are. That they, but how do they know where the green pastures are? Because they know where the shepherd is. Because sheep, they lead, they are led by the shepherd's voice. And so, and so, I want to encourage us. Let's get back in the Word. Let's get back um, to the biblical mandate of what our role and responsibilities are. And let's pray for this nation and be the light of the world that God is calling us to. And with that. Good night. We love you. We appreciate you. And we'll see you next time.